Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The latest installment of Twitter files revealing alleged censorship and misinformation campaigns. Who's behind it this time? An Intel official says he knew parts of the Hunter Biden laptop story had to be true, but he signed a statement discrediting it as Russian disinformation. President Biden still ignoring questions about the classified papers. That's as House Republicans assign members to the committee that's demanding answers. The U.S. is close to maxing out on its $31 trillion national debt once again. The battle over spending sparks a divided Congress. What Republicans want to cut and where Democrats draw the line. And a San Francisco panel proposes giving every qualified black resident in the city $5 million. How can residents qualify and does the city have a funding plan? We start the evening with an update on the deadly shooting after a Martin Luther King Jr. parade in Fort Pierce, Florida. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office says a total of eight people were shot at a block party after the event on Monday. One of the victims, a 30-year-old woman, passed away this morning. Police say they believe the shooting was the result of a dispute between two rival gangs. At this time, evidence supports uh, that this shooting was the result of a dispute between two rival Fort Pierce gangs. There were over 50 shell casings that were recovered from the scene from three different calibers of weapons. Police say four others got hurt when they tried to run away from the chaotic scene. Turning now to the latest installment of the so-called Twitter files. This time the documents focus on Big Pharma and the COVID vaccine. NTD's Arlene Richards has the update. The latest installment of the Elon Musk-endorsed Twitter files was released on Monday morning. It alleges that pharmaceutical companies lobbied social media to shape content around vaccine policy. Author Lee Fong tweeted the files, saying the push included direct pressure from Pfizer partner BioNTech to censor activists demanding low-cost generic vaccines for low-income countries. In 2020, there was an international push for the drug industry to make its COVID vaccines easier for low-income countries to access. But Fong says global drug giants saw the crisis as an opportunity for unprecedented profit and that they responded to the call with a massive lobbying blitz to crush any effort to share COVID-related information. The installment shows a screenshot of an alleged message to Twitter from German biotechnology company BioNTech in late 2020. It asked Twitter to hide its account to prevent tweets commenting about generic low-cost vaccines. In a subsequent email, a Twitter lobbyist in Europe reported that a request backed by the German government warned of an upcoming campaign targeting COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers. The lobbyist requested Twitter's moderation team have an eye on the relevant hashtags and the following accounts to include BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. The email asked Twitter to monitor the hashtags People's Vaccine and Join CTAP. The hashtags seemed to refer to the People's Vaccine Alliance, an activist group demanding equitable access to vaccines, and the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, an initiative to facilitate affordable access to COVID-19 health products. In April 2022, People's Vaccine Alliance posted a parody video spoofing that Big Pharma was profiting from the pandemic. The video was released in conjunction with the alliance's campaign targeting Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. The group called for COVID vaccine intellectual property rights to be suspended. According to Fong, it's not clear what actions Twitter ultimately took on the BioNTech request. Several Twitter employees noted in subsequent messages that none of this activism constituted abuse, but the company continued monitoring tweets. NTD reached out to BioNTech, but due to conflicting time zones, we haven't heard back yet. This report will be updated if the company sends a response. Arlene Richards, NTD News. In other Twitter-related news, owner Elon Musk is facing a court challenge over a tweet he posted five years ago claiming he would buy out Tesla. On Tuesday, a San Francisco federal court began jury selection for the class action lawsuit by Twitter investors. In August 2018, Musk tweeted that he secured funding to take Tesla private. 
In a follow-up tweet, Musk said investor support is confirmed and that he was waiting for a shareholder vote. Musk thought he was getting financial backing from Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. But when the funds didn't come, he ditched the plan. It resulted in a $40 million settlement with U.S. securities regulators. Musk says he agreed to the settlement under duress. The district court judge has denied Musk's request to transfer the trial to a federal court in Texas. And a former Intel officer is now saying he knew parts of the Hunter Biden laptop story had to be true. That's after discrediting it as Russian disinformation when the story first broke in 2020. Back in 2020, the New York Post first broke the Hunter Biden laptop story. It exposed the Biden family's business dealings in Ukraine, Hunter's drug abuse, and more. Just days after the first story broke, over 50 former intelligence officers, former officials, and others wrote this public statement saying it appeared as if the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation. Politico first published the statement. It reads, if we are right, this is Russia trying to influence how Americans vote in this election, and we believe strongly that Americans need to be aware of this. Then goes on to list various reasons. It ends, it is high time that Russia stops interfering in our democracy. Douglas Wise is a former deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and is one of many who signed off on the statement. But this week, The Australian reported that Wise said he's not surprised that the story turned out to be real. In fact, all of us figured that a significant portion of that content had to be real to make any Russian disinformation credible. Wise says people haven't read the statement properly, pointing to a part in which it says, we want to emphasize that we do not know if the emails are genuine or not, and that we do not have evidence of Russian involvement. However, various outlets used the statement to dismiss the laptop story. Politico released it in an article entitled, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo, dozens of former Intel officials say. The New York Times, Washington Post, CBS, and others only acknowledged the laptop story as factual last year, after two years of discrediting it. Reporting by Ariane Pazdar, NTD News. The U.S. is reaching its debt limit once again, and Congress must raise the spending limit to avoid economic consequences. But will Democrats and Republicans find common ground in the process? Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with the details. $31.4 $31.4 trillion. That's the current national debt. Congress will soon need to act to raise the debt limit, which was last raised by $2.5 trillion in December of 2021. Paying bills that we have already incurred. Federal investments in our defense, in housing, in education, in infrastructure. But in a sharply divided Congress, this task won't be easy. Republicans aiming to use the debt limit as leverage to win spending cuts elsewhere, such as returning to spending levels of 2022 or dollar-for-dollar cuts for any borrowing increase. To be able to rein in uh, out-of-control spending. Speaker McCarthy saying now's the time for negotiation. Let's change our behavior now. Let's sit down. He's the president. We're the majority in the House. The Democrats are the majority in the Senate. But the White House is pushing back, saying that this issue should be non-negotiable. As President Biden has made clear, Congress must deal with the debt limit and must do so without conditions. Democrats in Congress accuse Republicans proposed spending cuts as a way to hold social welfare programs hostage. We are not going to allow extreme MAGA Republicans to hold the American economy hostage, hold Social Security hostage, hold Medicare hostage. Leader McCarthy last week making a vow to protect those programs. We will always protect Medicare and Social Security. We will protect that for the next generation going forward. But we are going to scrutinize every single dollar spent. The U.S. did borrow $1.4 trillion in 2022. That's a figure that the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget calls staggering. That committee goes on to say that we should not be borrowing $4 billion a day, calling it an apparent debt addiction that is harmful to the economy and the budget. And Secretary Yellen has told lawmakers that the Treasury will begin to use so-called extraordinary measures to stay under the borrowing limit. Those extraordinary measures include things like suspending new investments along with other measures. Um, you know, but these, temp- these tools that the Treasury has to stay under this borrowing limit will run out come summer, by which time lawmakers will need to have had to come to an agreement on raising the debt limit. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. 
A Republican candidate who lost in the 2022 elections was arrested last night. He's accused of paying others to shoot at the homes of local Democratic Party politicians. Four Democrat state and county politicians in New Mexico were targeted in drive-by shootings in early December and January. That's after former Republican candidate Solomon Pena lost his race for state house in November. No one was injured in the shootings. Albuquerque police arrested Pena on Monday night. He's accused of conspiring with and paying four other men to shoot at the homes. Pena repeatedly said the election was rigged after losing to his opponent by less than 5,000 votes. And President Biden pressed again today on his handling of classified documents. But we're hearing little from him or the White House. Meanwhile, House Republicans assigned members to the Oversight Committee, which is demanding visitor logs of Biden's home. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Meeting with the Dutch Prime Minister on Tuesday, Biden again ignores reporters' shouted questions about his handling of classified documents. A similar scene played out yesterday. Are you sure there are no more classified documents? Biden hasn't spoken to reporters since he read a carefully worded statement last Thursday when the second batch of documents was found. And now as more files emerge, the White House goes on offense. A spokesperson on Tuesday accused House Republicans of faking outrage. The White House press secretary gets grilled on why Americans are not supposed to feel that way. That's for, uh, that's for the American people to decide, right? They also care about the economy, right? They also care about what is the president doing to lower costs, which is... The White House is also getting pressed on why it said a search for documents had been completed, but then more documents were found over the weekend. The press secretary deferring such questions to Biden's lawyers. I know there's going to continue to be dozens more questions probably today, and I will say, reach out to the White House Counsel's Office. You know, Americans continue to feel like they're seeing two tiers of justice here. As Republicans intensify calls for answers, we now know a bit more about who will be leading some of the investigations. House Republicans on Tuesday assigned members to the Oversight Committee, which is demanding visitor logs of Biden's home. To be seated on the panel are Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, Scott Perry, Byron Donalds, and Gary Palmer. Most of them are known allies of former President Trump. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. And in New York, prosecutors have dropped their case against a police officer who's accused of acting as a spy for the Chinese regime. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. Federal prosecutors in Brooklyn dropping their case against one of New York's finest. The New York Police Department officer had been accused of acting as a foreign agent on behalf of the Chinese regime. The officer is an ethnic Tibetan and naturalized U.S. citizen. He served as a U.S. Army reservist and was granted a so-called secret-level security clearance. His arrest came in September 2020. According to prosecutors, the officer reported on the activities of Chinese citizens in New York and helped access intelligence sources. He also gave Chinese officials access to senior NYPD officials through event invitations. Based on court documents, he told his Beijing handler that he sought NYPD promotions so he could assist the Chinese regime and bring, quote, glory to China. He had faced up to 55 years in jail if found guilty. Prosecutors filed a motion Friday asking a federal judge to dismiss the indictment. They said an investigation had led to additional information bearing on the charges. And over to the West Coast. San Francisco could pay every qualified long-term black resident $5 million. That's in a draft proposal from the city's reparations committee. NTD's Jason Blair has more. San Francisco's reparations committee pitched an updated draft proposal which includes $5 million to each qualified African-American resident. Also included is a comprehensive debt forgiveness program and for lower income qualifiers, financial supplementation to reflect the area median income of about $97,000 for 250 years. 
The proposal states a lump sum payment would compensate the affected population for the decades of harms that they have experienced and will redress the economic and opportunity losses that black San Franciscans have endured collectively as the result of both intentional decisions and unintended harms perpetuated by city policy. To qualify for a $5 million payment, the resident would need to be at least 18 years old and show that they have identified as black or African American for at least 10 years on public documents. The resident also must meet two of eight additional standards. This includes having lived in San Francisco for at least 13 years and or being a direct descendant of someone enslaved before 1865. So far, there are no official estimates on how much the proposal would cost the city. The committee is scheduled to make its final recommendation to leaders in June. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. If you have any news tips or feedback for our show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, the Ukraine and U.S.'s top generals meet face-to-face -face amid pressure to increase aid to Ukraine. And authorities call off the search for survivors in Saturday's airstrike. And in the NFL, what does the future hold for Tom Brady now that his team is eliminated for the season? NTD's Dave Martin weighs in on his options. That and more after this short break. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun. Featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. In international news, the U.S.'s top general, Mark Milley, in Poland today, meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart. The talk comes amid a push for more military aid for Ukraine and a new death toll in the strike on an apartment building in Dnipro. Ukraine's top general, Valery Zaluzhny, says he outlined his forces' urgent needs in a first personal meeting with the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, on Tuesday. Kyiv is asking for a fleet of Western battle tanks, which it says could drive out Russian troops. And the West's big holdout, Germany, said Tuesday its new defense minister has the request at the top of his agenda. The country is under pressure to supply its Leopard 2 tanks, but its government says they should be supplied only if there is agreement among Kyiv's main allies, particularly the U.S. We could see movement on Friday after U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin hosts allies at an airbase in Germany to discuss further aid for Ukraine. German-made Leopard battle tanks are widely seen as the only plausible option available in sufficient numbers. But they can't be delivered without authorization from Berlin. Germany has been cautious about approving weapons that could be seen as escalating conflict. But allies increasingly argue that concern is misplaced, with Russia showing no sign of backing down from its assault on its neighbor. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, in an interview for Bloomberg TV Tuesday, stressed the need to continue supporting Ukraine against an imperialistic aggressor and said discussions with Germany's allies on tanks were ongoing, but that they should not be conducted in public. The UK on Monday confirmed it would send 14 Challenger 2 tanks and other hardware to Ukraine. British Defence Minister Ben Wallace urging Berlin to act. Uh, to do that, uh, these tanks are not offensive uh, when they are used for defensive methods. And a shipload of US military hardware arrived in the Danish port of Aarhus ahead of a series of training exercises across NATO's eastern frontier countries. 
Meanwhile, Ukrainian authorities on Tuesday called an end to the search for survivors in the ruins of an apartment building destroyed during Russian missile attacks on Saturday. At least 44 people confirmed dead, 20 still missing and 79 wounded. Russia has denied intentionally targeting civilians. It calls its actions in Ukraine a special military operation to protect its security. Ukraine and its allies accuse Moscow of an unprovoked war to grab territory. Ukraine's First Lady spoke at the World Economic Forum's Davos meeting today, urging support for her nation. And China has announced its first population decline in decades. The National Bureau of Statistics reported today that the country had 850,000 fewer people at the end of 2022 than the previous year. That left a total of just over 1.4 billion people. It wasn't immediately clear if the population figures have been affected by the COVID-19 outbreak, but experts find China's statistics unreliable. Yi Fuxian, a population expert at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, says China's population has actually been declining since 2018, and that all of China's past economic, social, defense and foreign policies were based on faulty demographic data. And a classical Chinese dance troupe is touring around the world with the mission of reviving the China of before communism. And audience members are saying it's more than just a performance. Let's take a look. Last week, Birmingham's International Convention Center welcomed dancers and musicians from Shenyun Performing Arts. Spectacular, colorful, beautiful. It's very sort of ordered, very disciplined, the way all the dancers are, and yet it's not mechanical. They make you look very beautiful. It just sort of like gets to you, you're sort of like absolutely mesmerized by the colors and the costumes and the way everybody moves all together and synchronized. Gives you a tingly feeling. Overall was exquisite and absolutely breathtaking. I would love, absolutely love to be able to choreograph myself to that standard. Hailing from New York, Shenyun has become the world's premier classical Chinese dance group. Each performance is story-based bring to life the 5,000 years of traditional Chinese culture on stage. And I didn't know there was so much culture in China. I didn't realize that the different areas had a different culture and, and their different dance techniques and how they express themselves in China. It was amazing when they were talking about how far it went back as well, how, how far music has had a massive impact in China from very early on. I thought it was amazing. I got absolutely immersed in culture of China. It's really important to think that history is always being made. So for me, it's also about what is happening now and how in 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, that is going to become history. So people will see that as well. So I think that's really good to put that into a performance. According to Shenyun's website, the heroic figures presented epitomize the noblest virtues of Chinese civilization. They also communicate moral values that are relevant to modern society. This brings uh, the, the grace of God, the grace of the divine, into living expression in the dance and the movement and the color, everything about it was uh, a living portrayal of the beauty of life, really. I think that's a message for us all to use our physique in a, in a way that's graceful, you know, not uh, hard and rigid, you know, where life is meant to be a flow. It, it's really good to sort of like understand that behind everything that is happening there's always traditions it takes you back to basics so you know it really gives you the basic fundamentals of what what humans should be and what they should believe in Shenyun's new touring season runs through may ntd news birmingham uk as part of their world tour shenyun is performing in georgia alabama north carolina colorado and oregon this week now, over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. Tom Brady's season, and possibly his career, ended with the Buccaneers' elimination last night, an ugly loss at the hands of the Dallas Cowboys. Brady said afterwards regarding the possibility of retirement, quote, I'm going to go home and get a good night's sleep, as good as I can tonight. This has been all I've focused on, this game. It'll just be one day at a time, truly. Brady's contract runs out after this season and specifies that the franchise tag cannot be placed on him, making him a free agent should he decide to keep playing. 
Now last offseason, the Miami Dolphins were punished for trying to recruit both Brady and former Saints head coach Sean Payton in what would have been a dream combination. Payton is technically a retired coach still under contract to the Saints, but he recently said he'd like to return to the game fueling speculation he and Brady could team up elsewhere. Brady also was retired for roughly 40 days last winter before changing his mind. And in college basketball news, a game between the Iowa Hawkeyes and Northwestern Wildcats scheduled for Wednesday is canceled due to quote, COVID-19 health and safety protocols within the Northwestern program. That's according to Northwestern. The team is down to just six available players, according to Jeff Goodman of Stadium, though it's unclear whether half the team has tested positive with symptoms or just has to sit out due to contact tracing procedures. The game is the only known one this season canceled over COVID. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, the NBA has a quadruple header planned as the once hot Brooklyn Nets look to snap a two game losing streak playing in San Antonio. And finally, for you hockey fans, the NHL has eight games on tap, including the West leading Winnipeg Jets playing at Montreal. And that's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.